Long ago in the Marethic era, when the old Nords, the Atmorans, first set foot on Tamriel, they brought with them their bizarre pantheon. The faces of the divines were not men, but beasts. For each of these deities we know in modern times, there was one animal representation. There was the hawk, the wolf, the snake, moth, owl, whale, bear, fox, and most importantly, the dragon. These ancient Nords worshipped the dragons, revering them with grand displays of obedience and the construction of mighty temples and structures in their honour. Dragons were considered superior to men, and the dragons gladly accepted their role as god kings over the mortals. The dragons enlisted human dragon priests to rule over the small, soft, bipedal creatures in their stead, and they soon became corrupted by this power and influence, ruling their fellow men with an iron fist. When the people revolted against their rulers, the dragons intervened, displaying their true power and along with the priests, butchered thousands of Nords. The dragon war was swift and brutal, but some dragons were sympathetic to the cause of men and bestowed the ancient secret magics upon them, magics that could be used to wipe the dragons from Tamriel. Parthenax, the younger brother of the world eater Alduin, defected to the side of the men and taught them to use the thumb, the power of the voice. Dragons were soon driven away, slaughtered in the masses, and Alduin was banished forward in time by an Elder Scroll. To quell his draconic thirst for power, Parthenax retired to the summit of the Throat of the World, allowing humans to continue to utilize the art of the Thumb. Such a potent form of magic was hard to control, but one man in the First Era found a way. Parthenax and many powerful wielders of the Thum followed his teachings, and they became known as the Greybeards, and their silent order of monks endured the errors, choosing silence over domination, separating themselves from politics and war, hiding an ancient power that could tear down empires and change the very fabric of the world around them. So just how powerful are the humble Greybeards? Hey guys, it's Scott here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. In this video, we're going to delve deep into everything there is to know about this fascinating ancient order of silent monks and their incredible past may just give us an idea of their true power. Thankfully, these mortals seem beyond corruption and their abilities lie dormant, used to honor the gods instead of conquering the realm. So we know a bit about the magnitude of the Thum's power. While there was no one factor that turns the tide of the Dragon War, the ability for mortals to access dragon-slaying magics was crucial to the survival of the Nords. But where do the Grey Beards come into this? And why hasn't the power of the Thum been used by Nords in conquest of Tamriel? Even now, in the 201st year of the Fourth Era, a bloody civil war is ravaging the Nordic province. Why do the Nords just sit by and fight fairly when they have such supreme magics at their disposal? Well, this is all result of a man we mentioned just a few moments ago, who, despite his immense potential, did not allow power to corrupt him and his people. This man is Jürgen Windcaller. Jürgen Windcaller is considered to be one of, if not the greatest, tongue of all time. Tongue being another name for a mortal with the power of the thumb the voice, or the dragon language. He was a warrior and the warlord in the first empire of Nords present in the first era. The Nords lusted for a large and prosperous kingdom and they were not shy in their attempts to cross the Volothi Mountains, claiming chunks of modern day Morrowind, formerly known as Resdane, for their empire. But it was under Jürgen's rule that the Nords suffered a crippling defeat on the foothills of Red Mountain and they were driven from the land by the joint efforts of the Kaima and the Dwemer. The defeat gave Jürgen an epiphany and acted as the catalyst to his drastic change in perspective. He realized after seven long years meditating on how such strong voices could fail and reconciling the sheer number of men lost in the battle, that the Nords who could channel the Thum were being irresponsible with their power. He concluded that the gods punished them for their arrogant and downright blasphemous use of the voice, which was a gift from Kine and their gods. This belief was supported by the fact that the dragons had been punished previously for their tyrannical use of their powers. The voice was to be used to venerate the gods, not for mortal victories and the annexation of foreign lands. What better way to prove your control over inhuman power and achieve enlightenment than to do the very thing that makes any tongue useless? choosing silence, when all your might comes from your voice, is the ultimate display of discipline and modesty. Jürgen began to preach his findings to his fellow Nords. Many were amazed, but many more rebelled. But it was this rebellion that proved the weight of his message. Seventeen masters of the voice challenged him to combat, barraging him with an onslaught of dragon shouts. 
Jürgen did not rise to their provocations and instead swallowed their shouts for three days until the mighty tongues had no energy left. With parched throats and lost voices, they accepted defeat and acknowledged Jürgen's wisdom. In order to live out his years in Tamriel, atop the throat of the world, the newly founded Greybeards reside in their secluded monastery, isolated from the goings-on of common people. Kind's breath upon this mountain is widely believed by the Nords to be the circumstances of the Nords' creation, and any Nord may embark on a pilgrimage up the 7,000 steps to bring them closer to enlightenment. Since the first era and the Nords' defeat at the hands of the Chimer and the Dwemer, the way of the voice has kept the Thum in check. The only time we hear from the Greybeards is when they herald the coming of a new Dragonborn, as they did for Tiber Septum before his unification of Tamriel into the Third Empire, and for the last Dragonborn, who appeared seemingly from nowhere in the 201st year of the Fourth Era. Mortals who fulfill the Dragonborn prophecy are important to the Greybeards as they are blessed with the blood and soul of a dragon by Akatosh himself, the father of dragons and chief of the divines. Unlike tongues and masters of the voice, Dragonborns do not require training or a lifetime of study to learn the draconic speech. They can absorb the knowledge directly from a dead dragon's soul. Aside from Mirak, the first Dragonborn, all of the Dragonborns seem to have been gone after the Septim Dynasty came to an end with Martin Septim at the climax of the Oblivion Crisis. Upon his return, Alduin may have been able to capitalize on the pacifist nature of the Greybeards, but the rise to prominence of the last Dragonborn seems to be a certain intervention from the gods to crush arrogance and blasphemous abuse of power. Anyways, from our experiences in Cyrodiil during the Oblivion Crisis, witnessing Martin Septim light the dragonfires and through the eyes of the last dragonborn, we get a glimpse of the power the Greybeards may possess. Let's not forget the fact that we only really see dragonborns use their powers in battle, for their powers are generally gifted to them by the gods in the interest of maintaining balance and order. Unlike the dragonborns, the masters of the voice were not born with all the answers to the Thum. Instead, they studied the inner workings of the ancient magic, passing on knowledge for over four thousand years. It's almost impossible to comprehend the wealth of wisdom these monks must possess, considering how much the last Dragonborn is capable of within moments of learning their powers. We see firsthand that through the use of the Thum, a master of the voice can alter the elements using the forces of earth, wind, fire, frost, and air. They can change the weather and become ethereal, they can pacify and incite and bend beasts to their will, and that's only just the beginning. Some were so powerful that engaging their vocal cords caused great destruction instantaneously, forcing them to remain gagged or mute for their entire lives, their only means to communicate coming from sign language and scribed runes. When the Greybeards speak, storms brew above High Hrothgar, and people are forced to evacuate due to the imminent danger of avalanches. When High King Wolfarth travelled to meet them, believing he was a figure of prophecy, he was blasted to ash. Such is their power. The last time they spoke was when they announced the destiny of a young type of septum. When they spoke his name, the world shook. A good example of the Greybeard's power comes from an unlikely source. If you saw our recent video on the White Vial, you'll know what I'm talking about. The Vial was a thing of legend to fanatical alchemists because it had the extraordinary power to instantly amplify and purify any liquid placed within it, and on top of that the contents of the Vial would replenish forevermore, providing eternal sustenance. It is a relic capable of providing salvation to mortals with one foot already in the grave. It is a holy grail and a miracle cure, but how was such a magnificent artifact created? Well, it was done with a few simple words. The file was crafted using a substance called unmelting snow. The snow is immune to heat and the fires of the Deadlands couldn't turn it into water. It is believed that this patch of unmelting snow exists because the Greybeards taught it to ignore the sun, causing heat to simply wash over it. A Greybeard can cause a continent-wide earthquake of devastating magnitude if they so much as sneeze, and whispering a few words to a pile of frozen water can bend the rules of nature, granting it invulnerability. Maybe it is for the best that the Greybeards are so adamant about adhering to Jürgen Windhaller's principles, only ever revealing their power when a circumstance of true need prevents itself, and never for the goal of conquest or violence. The Greybeards and the Akaviri Dragon Guard we know as the Blades both have a similar reverence 
reverence for the Dragonborn, yet the Blades hate the Greybeards for their inaction and not helping the Blades to defeat their common enemies. On the other hand, the Greybeards despise the Blades, viewing them as genocidal meddlers uh, who have always sought to turn the Dragonborn away from the path of wisdom. If the Greybeards were quick to flex their vocal cords, dictating the fate of wars, they could be contradicting the very foundation of their order. The voice is to be used in reverence to Kine and the gods, not in the affairs of men and myrrh. So the Greybeards, with their unrivaled power, seclude themselves in the mountains, only involving themselves in the power games of Tamriel when the balance is in jeopardy. Even if this means watching the Nords lose their land to the Thalmor at the end of the Skyrim Civil War, they are bound by the way of the voice to sit as idle bystanders. The Greybeards are a civilized beast. They could destroy Tamriel in a heartbeat and conquer it even quicker, but for the good of the continent, their ancient and almighty power is kept safe and secluded, high up on the slopes of the throat of the world. Thanks so much for coming along on this journey into the mystical order of monks we know as the Greybeards. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned a thing or two along the way. If you did, a like would go a long way and if you're new, consider subscribing. Once again, I've been Scott and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.